we were discussing uh, channel responses and uh, trying to say how to characterize it for data communication. Our communication system looks like this. We have the discrete symbols a k defined in discrete time, then they are modulated by some pulse p of t and most frequently this p of t is a full width rectangular pulse. What this means is that uh, this uh, is what is known as non return to 0. or NRZ signaling. I okay. will assume that AK is binary, it is either plus or minus 1. So, you take this pulse or it is uh, negative and then transmit it based on the symbols. Okay. So, at this point you would get that right, the symbols multiplied by P and there will be some absolute amplitude. I have chosen one here, but the voltage level will be something. It can be few hundred millivolts typically. Okay. Then we go through the channel. Which is H of T. It has some impulse response that is what it means. Okay. And what we want to do at the receiver <coughs> is to sample this okay, at integer multiples of t naught with some timing offset. The timing offset will be the optimum stuff, right? We want to sample in the middle of the eye, that was the idea, and make decisions at those samples, and we will have the received symbols. B k right and obviously, if uh, the communication channel is working as we want it to B k should be the same as A k right. Whatever symbols we transmit should be received. <coughs> now, depending on how bad this channel is that may not happen and then we will have to do some things. Uh, some noise gets added here, we can add it somewhere in the along the chain. Typically, we can show it as some noise getting added at the input of the receiver right that can that includes the noise contributions from everywhere. Now, this is the most commonly used pulse in uh, high speed signaling, but you can have uh, other other possibilities like let me call this T naught T naught by 2. So, it is 1 for uh, half a cycle and then 0 for the remaining half cycle. So, this is known as uh, return to 0 pulse or R z. Okay. The advantage of something like this is that timing recovery or clock recovery is easier, because even if you have consecutive identical digits, you will have transitions, right? you will know the bit boundaries. The problem with uh, non return to 0 is if you send two consecutive bits, there is no nothing that demarcates the boundary between them. If you send 10 consecutive uh, bits, you will just get 1 for a long period. You do not know where the bit boundaries are. That is not the case with return to 0, right. For every bit, there will be an edge. Okay. So, the clock recovery is easier, but what is the problem with this? Yeah. So, now you are sending an arrow or pulse like half the size, it is double the bandwidth. As it is, we are reeling from a shortage of bandwidth, right. We are uh, talking about high speed communications where bandwidth is at a premium. So, you definitely do not want to do this. Okay. So, this is better for clock recovery, but higher bandwidth. So, that is why you do not choose things like this, you use the simple NRZ, NRZ signaling. Okay. Now, one way to model this whole thing excluding the noise of course, noise will get added, but 
here we have a discrete time signal and after the sampling we have a discrete time signal. Okay. So, to model the behavior from here to there as a discrete time channel, okay, a discrete time impulse response. What you do is you send a single one, this uh, the sequence that you send is a single one with all zeros. You will get some discrete time sequence over there. Looking at that, you can tell like what happens, right? And we assume that this T S is magically adjusted to catch the peak of the response. Is this okay? That is what we were trying to do. So, essentially what we have what happens is if uh, we send a single one into P of t we get a single rectangular pulse that rectangular pulse goes into the channel uh, with an impulse response h of t and it gives you something it is the rectangular pulse converted by h of t. Okay. So, we look at that output and depending on how broad it is we can see what to do about it. Okay. We have this single pulse which is modulated by P of t and h of t. So, what we get here is P convolved by h and this is sampled with an offset T s and here we get some let me call it g of n. Okay. So, depending on what h of t is, p of t let us say is like this and h of t if let us say it was a first order R c type response then the impulse response of a first order RC low pass filter is like that right. Initially the capacitor gets charged to some voltage and then exponentially decays. Okay. So, then P of t convolved with H of t would be something like that okay. and then we will assume that this T s is adjusted to catch this peak then we will have the other samples. Okay. So, that is now a discrete time response this g of n. Okay. You can even write the expression for it it is quite easy for the case of the first order filter, but we do not have to write the closed form expression we just need to know what it is. Okay. in case of a more complicated channel if uh, t naught you send it through h of t you may get something like that okay and somewhere it may even have ringing and so on and we assume T s is adjusted to do that. So, we have some g of n okay. that is the discrete time impulse response and by definition I will take the peak and call it g of 0 I mean I define 
0 to be over there. So, this much you can simulate, if you have a simulator that can simulate linear circuits you should be able to do this. Normally, uh, the way you measure the channel is, you have a channel and then maybe you have some connectors here, it could be a trace on a PCB of the appropriate length and then you use what is known as a vector. network analyzer. This also has two ports and it can be calibrated to remove the effect of all this cabling and give you the parameters of the two port parameters of what is between those two points okay. and the usually the parameters that you measure are S parameters. You do know that there have like different sets of uh, two port parameters, right? Y parameters, Z parameters, H parameters, and Z parameters, and so on. So, this is one more uh, set of uh, parameters. I won't discuss them in detail right now, but uh, if you specify any set of two port parameters, you can get any other set using some formula, okay. <coughs> now, in general, at high frequencies, you tend to use S parameters. Why is this? Have you come across S parameters? If you have done EM and so on, uh, some transmission lines you may have seen them. Why use S parameters? I mean, if I had Y parameters, it looks like something even easier. Huh? Why? Okay, let us not get into whether it is a waveguide and so on, it is true like uh, these S parameters are uh, defined in terms of uh, incident and reflected waves, Okay, not just voltages with respect to some ground. So, if you get into waveguides and so on, there is not even, there are not even two terminals where you apply a voltage. So, let us not get there, Okay, let us talk about a trace on a PCB, I mean it is or a coaxial cable, it does have two terminals on this side and that side. What is the difficulty with specifying y parameters? It will of course, be frequency dependent in some complicated way. How do you measure y parameters? Huh? Shorted. So, basically to uh, measure either y or z parameters, you have to either short circuit or open circuit the other port. Okay? This is very difficult to arrange at high frequencies. You cannot get either ideal short circuits or ideal open circuits. Whereas, these S parameters are measured with a termination of 50 ohms, okay, which is lot easier to get. So, that is why for measurement, it is lot easier to arrange uh, uh, <coughs> a termination like 50 ohms rather than an ideal short or an ideal open. Okay. So, that is the reason for using, uh, that is one of the reasons for using S parameters. The other one of course, is that it is more general and then is defined in terms of waves. So, you can define it in cases where we do not have these voltages and currents defined. But even when they are defined, uh, even like for high frequency, even for circuits, right, which are kind of small, strictly small, you still it is a lot harder to arrange for a perfect short circuit so that you can measure uh, y parameters. It is easier to terminate it in 50 ohms and measure s parameters. Now, of course, the channel is a passive reciprocal element. Okay, So, its response depends on the termination. We assume that we have proper termination on the two sides. This is the channel and then R not. I assumed it is like properly terminated, but if you want to simulate the effect of uh, improper termination, you can also do that. Right? You can change the values of R s and R l and do that. So, this H of t is basically the impulse response of the channel with this termination or you can uh, simulate H convolved with p directly by making V s uh, 
rectangular pulse and measuring what appears at the receiver. Okay. So, you can simulate the whole thing directly. So, you need either a simulator that can deal with uh, an element which is specified in terms of S parameters or you can change the S parameter model into something else. We will talk about that. You can uh, fit a linear continuous time filter uh, for the given S parameters with the given termination and then use that and so on. Okay. So, either way you can determine this convolution and from there you can sample it. Let us say initially we sample at the peak and integer multiples of uh, T naught away from that and this by definition this is the cursor and this is post cursor and this is pre cursor. Okay. Now, let us say this this part has already been done because this you know the channel you know what pulse you are sending in it is a rectangular pulse of T V and you found this and you adjusted the clock recovery to get the peak and all these things. Now, how will you figure out how the at this high level right we have not gone into any circuit level detail. So, let us say we have this stuff okay, with some amount of noise how will you find out what the error rate will be or whether you will be able to <coughs> recover the data correctly. First of all, if h of t was uh, I mean an impulse that is it simply gives you whatever is input the output is the same that is h of t is just an impulse right it is the ideal channel. Then what would be the error rate how would you calculate that. Huh? So, it is basically you know the amplitude of the input. So, the same thing comes there and then you know the variance of noise from these two you can find the error rate. Okay. So, now h of t is something else it is such that finally, from h of t you derive all this discrete time stuff. So, now how will you find the error rate? Uh, uh. Is that correct? So, he is saying you take this uh, peak amplitude here and then the variance of the noise and from that cal uh. Uh, So, how will you do that? So, basically now this is the response to each symbol. Okay. Now, you have a random sequence of uh, symbols, okay, sequence of uh, symbols which are random I mean let us say the usual identically distributed stuff it is either plus 1 or minus 1 with a probability of half. How will you find the error rate? How will you calculate the variance of the amplitude? Okay. So, if you look at this uh, sampled uh, signal, okay, at the input of the slicer, what is that going to be? Slicer meaning, I mean this decision uh, element, right? This is this is called a slicer. It just slices the symbols into plus one or minus one. Okay. I am saying the signal there is some discrete time signal, right? What is that? So let's say I denote that signal by some. I do not know why, but an instant L, what is that going to be? Yeah, so what is the expression? Yeah, so it is basically let us say the L symbol, I am ignoring all the delays and so on, right. That is why I set the cursor to be at time 0. Of course, I mean you are not getting a uh, if you send a signal you are not going to get a response before that, but uh, I have taken the peak of that and defined that to be the time 0. So, it will be al times g of 0 right plus what a l minus 1 times g of 1 okay. 
it is basically the convolution integral and it also runs in the other direction. So, it could be a l plus 1 times g of uh, minus 1 and so on. Okay. So, this part is the cursor. So, these are the contribution of symbols that came before obviously. This is the this is known as post cursor ISI. ISI is the inter symbol interference. Okay. So, all the symbols that came before A l minus 1, A l minus 2 and so on also contribute to the values here. Okay. So, this is known as post cursor ISI and then this is the precursor ISI. This is due to symbols that came after A l, okay. A l plus 1, A l plus 2 and so on. There will be a limited number of uh, precursor ISI elements, because the system is after all causal, right. it cannot go all the way to minus infinity, but the post cursor stuff you can have the summation going up to minus infinity. Of course, in any real case after a certain amount of time these things can be neglected. Is this okay? So, you will have the desired received symbol corrupted by post cursor ISI and precursor ISI. Okay. So, basically what I want to now decide is whether uh, this is good enough or not, I mean in terms of bit error rate. Okay. So, how will I calculate the bit error rate? Uh, okay. And then huh, that is an interesting thing. So, what he is saying is basically these A L's are all like random, right? I mean, let us say we take the received symbol to be plus 1, the remaining k ones can be either minus 1 or plus 1. Now, each of these is either plus 1 or minus 1 with a probability of half. So, you will have some number of uh, these things, but let me take a simple case. Let me assume that this uh, g of n has only like four elements. Okay. So, this g So, let us say and the rest are 0, this is just for illustration, right. This is okay. Let me assume that the received symbol is uh, the actual uh, that A l the uh, intended received symbol is 1, exactly the same thing holds for minus 1, the case is symmetrical, right. So, let me say that uh, A l is 1. So, the received value will be g of 0 plus the post cursor ISI that is a l minus 1 g of 1 plus a l minus 2 g of 2 plus a l plus 1 g of minus 1. Okay. Which one? No, no, that is what, what I am saying is basically. So, <coughs> let me show this properly. G of minus 1 should be, no, no, once again. So, let me show you what I meant by this. So, let us say I send a rectangular pulse here, okay, of width uh, T naught. The actual received stuff. will be first of all there will be the channel is of certain length. So, for a while you will not get anything at all. Okay. So, let us say this is the delay corresponding to the length of the channel okay. and after that because of bandwidth limitation it is also not going to give you a pulse. If it was an ideal transmission line after that you would get a rectangular pulse. Now, you will get something I mean it rises kind of very gradually and then falls even more like that. Okay. So, now I take the peak of this 
and from there I find the responses at integer multiples of t away. Now, by definition I label this as 0. Okay. So, it is very much causal actually the symbol that you send here is giving the response over there, okay. but I, that all that delay I have just removed and so now I mean it is certainly not anti, uh, like anti causal, right? but it is convenient to call this 0 and then call this minus 1 and so on you understand. So, when you send a pulse you will get a peak that is much that comes much after the pulse is sent depending on the length of the channel. right? The delay is like quite uh, I mean it is quite arbitrary for like for a 10 centimeter channel it is something for 100 centimeter channel it is something else, okay. but whatever it is that peak is what I call 0 in, my, in order to avoid this cumbersome notation. Okay. So, this uh, cursor is by definition 0 and this is post and this is pre. Okay. So, the way the future symbols affect you is that the reason it affects you is because it takes more than one symbol interval to rise. Okay. Because the next symbol if I send another let us say unit pulse here. I will assume that I will send another plus 1. The response to that will be what? It is exactly the same pulse, but delayed by another cycle, right. So, it will start somewhere over here and then it will do that. Okay. So, now this minus 1 element of this is coincident with that. So, that is why it is affecting you. Okay. The you will have precursor ISI only if the rise from 0 to the peak is longer than 1 symbol interval. Okay. If it rises within 1 symbol interval you will not have that, but that can be in a real case it can be longer than a symbol interval it can be 2 or 3, but not more than that probably and it will never be infinite I mean for sure because it is causal. Okay. This is okay. This is how a future symbol affects it, but I mean, like somebody said, you can make everything causal with a sufficient amount of delay, right? So, that is how this is. So, now the question is I want to calculate the bit error rate when I have something like this, right? So, here AL is 1, I should uh, receive this should give me a result of 1, but because of noise, it will not give me. But uh, how will I find out what the bit error rate is? That is what I was asking earlier. He suggested something which is you this itself is some random quantity now, right? Because A L minus 1, A L minus 2, and A L plus 1 can be either plus or minus 1 with a probability of half. So, that will have some variance, and he said you take that variance and add it to the variance of noise and assume that is the total noise. Will that work? Consider the worst case. Okay, just tell me. I mean, this is now a probability problem, right? So <coughs> these three can be either plus one or minus one with a probability of half. Okay. So now, what is the probability that I will send this through a comparator, a slicer, and say that the result is minus one? That is basically the value of this should be less than zero. How would I do that? Just do it from first principles of probability. Yeah, so what I mean, tell me some more details like give me an expression or something to, for the error. How will I do this one? Yeah. Assume what is constant? Okay. 
actually I am not sure what you mean by g of n is constant, I mean all elements of g are the same. Okay. I mean how would you do this like a uh, first of all how many different values do you have let me call this I do not know what if I had a notation for this I call this y of l right. Yeah, so first of all how many like uh, what is the distribution of y of l can you tell me how many different values are possible for y of l. Huh? what is it 8 right because I mean you have 3 different uh, things that can vary randomly here a l minus 1 a l minus 2 and a l plus 1 and all of them can be can take one of two values and independently of each other. So, it is 8 possible values ok. So, then how will you calculate the better rate? No, let us say all of them lie above 0. I want to calculate the bit error rate, what should I do? I want to calculate the probability where I have transmitted 1, right. This is what I will get, ok. I want to calculate the probability that this sum here becomes smaller than 0, that is the probability of error. So, what, what how do I do this? Now, I am saying the summation of this actually never becomes less than 0. But the, why why do we have bit errors in the communication system? Huh? Yeah, no, I know. But why why does it even happen? I mean, why does one get identified as zero? Because we have random noise added to the whole thing, right? We have a Gaussian distributed noise which is added to the receiver. Okay, so that is there. So maybe the problem itself was not posed clearly. What I'm saying is. this is the system we have right. So, if I look at the lth one it will have a pulse modulating it let us say that is 1 and then that goes through h of t. So, we get whatever here due to the lth symbol as well as due to l plus 1 symbol l minus 1 symbol and l minus second symbol ok. Some noise is added ok its variance is some sigma n ok. So, now you tell me what the better rate is. Yeah, if h of t is the just an impulse, okay, what would be the bit error rate? Exactly. So in each of the cases, depending on the symbol combination, you will have a certain bit error rate. Okay. So for instance. So, first of all if we had a case where g of n was just an impulse right everything else is 0. This means that basically the transmitted symbol is coming in with the transmitted signal is coming in without any change ok. So, this is 1 and then I have if I send 1 I will get 1 and to this I have a Gaussian noise I think this is the maybe you know this notation n of 0 comma sigma n this means that this is the mean value of the Gaussian noise which is 0 by for our case and then it has some standard deviation ok. And then I look at this this is 1 1 plus this uh, Gaussian noise and I slice this basically I look at the sign of this what is the probability of this will be what is the probability that this will be minus 1. It is basically, so yeah, so the probability of uh, I mean just the noise it has a probability density function like that ok and 1 plus noise that has a probability density function that is like this it is the same thing moved to 1. So, what is the error rate? it is the area of this part of the curve 
which is less than 0. Okay. So, there is a definition for it. <coughs> so, first of all, uh, did not we discuss this actually earlier while discussing clock jitter and so on, this error rate etcetera. Yeah, there was some So, we said this I do not remember if I have the expression for q. So, this itself the expression for the probability density function of a Gaussian what is it? Square root 2, 2 pi sigma n exponential ok. So, this is when I have a normal distribution with a standard deviation sigma n mean 0, the probability of x taking a certain value is given the probability density function uh, at x is given by this. Okay. Is this fine? Is this correct? Okay. So, now uh, this error rate here what is this? Minus infinity to minus 1 of okay so i think this is what is defined by this q function right q function of what 1 by sigma n i think this is what it is i have to check the definition whether it's some other square, square root 2 or something but i think this is right this is okay so this is known as the q function so basically the argument of the q function tells you I mean the argument of the q function are what the signal value is and what the standard deviation of the noise is okay? and that makes sense like for instance if instead of 1 this was something else if this was 2 what would happen I mean or maybe half the Gaussian would have moved only to half and you would have q of uh, half by sigma n which would be a larger value. Okay? So, this q function is basically uh, defined so that you can find the probability of error when you send a signal amplitude of certain value add a certain noise sigma into it you will get a uh, bit error you will get an error rate which is q of the signal divided by noise it is related to the SNR. Okay. So, this is what it is when g of n itself is an impulse right that is the channel is not distorting the signal in any way. Now, when we do have the pre and post cursor ISI, how will you find the bit error rate now? In every case, now you have multiple uh, like possible uh, signal values for the same input. For an input of 1, the received value is not just 1, it depends on the previous and uh, post, previous and uh, uh, future symbols. Okay. So, let me write this out long hand for this. So, A L is 1, then you have A L plus 1, A L minus 1, A L minus 2. So, we have 8 possible cases here. What are they? Okay. And each of these possibilities each of these patterns has a probability of 1 8th right because everything is independent and identically distributed. So, each of these has a probability of 1 8th. Now, what is the received value in each of these cases? <coughs> what will it be? So, in this case it is you always have g of 0 because of the cursor and in this case the rest of it would be g of uh, minus 1 minus g of 1 minus g of 2. Okay. Similarly, here it is g of 0 and minus g of uh, minus 1 minus g of 1 plus g of 2. Right? 
So, basically this one this corresponds to the sign here. Okay. So, essentially these minuses and plus keeps on flipping in every case like for instance in the last case it will be everything is added together. Right. Now, what is the probability of uh, this one being less than 0? What is the probability of this being less than 0? Q of Q of this divided by sigma n right and this is q of this divided by sigma n. So, for each of these cases there is a different error rate. Okay. Now, first of all note that uh, if you look at these values the received this uh, sorry. So, you have some g of 0 okay, and <coughs> the actual received values will be symmetrically distributed around this okay, because if you look at this plus minus patterns they are symmetrical. Okay, You have minus 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 and you have plus 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 okay, these two will be symmetrically around g of uh, this one and so on. So, there will be 8 different values they may not be equally distributed I am just drawing it in some way. I mean they may not be equally spaced okay I am drawing it in some way so for instance this could correspond to g of 0 plus g of 1 plus g of uh, I mean g of 2 plus g of minus 1 okay and this will correspond to all of them being negative okay all of them uh, subtracting from the cursor value and if you look at the probability of each of these desired values the probability density function is an impulse I mean is a set of impulses right because each of these has a probability of how much 1 eighth each has a probability of 1 eighth. Okay. Now, if your received symbol is here there is some probability of error if your received symbol is there there is some other probability of error which is much smaller. So, what is the total probability of error? it is basically you sum all these uh, q values and multiply by 1 eighth. Okay. It is basically 1 eighth the probability of getting this combination is 1 eighth the probability of getting an error with this combination is this whole thing. So, 1 eighth times this plus 1 eighth times that or so on. Okay. We can almost always assume equal distribution for all patterns because we have uh, uncorrelated bits. right? So, if you have n uh, so, you have the cursor and beyond the cursor let us say you have n non-zero elements how many possibilities do you have. Huh? So, I have the 2 power n basically 2 raise to n. So, I have the, the, the impulse response is n plus 1 elements long you have one cursor and the remaining ones are uh, the ISI elements. So, there are n ISI elements. So, those symbols can be I mean if for a binary input data they can have a total of 2 to the n possible combinations. Okay. So, the received uh, the, uh, the there are 2 to the n possibilities each of these corresponds to a different error rate and you have to average all the error rates this is okay. If you add noise the distribution becomes like this I will show it somewhat exaggerated. So, this will have distribution like that and the next one will have a distribution like that. Okay. So, there will be so many Gaussians you have to look at the area of the Gaussian in the negative part and then add up all of that is all this is okay. So, that is how you find the uh, average bit error rate this is okay. Now, <coughs> as a quick estimate you can take this worst case because this Gaussian the q function uh, you know it uh, drops quite rapidly right after a while it just drops very rapidly. So, 
the bitter rate for this whatever I have highlighted will be substantially more than that for this one which will be lot more than that for this and typically ok. Typically it will be like that. So, the bitter rates for these other things will be a lot smaller than that one. So, as a worst case you can take just this one and calculate the q corresponding to that signal ok. So, that is the smallest symbol that you can get right. What is the value of that? Where every other every inter symbol interference element is adding in the opposite direction ok. So, in general <coughs> you have a certain g of n this is the sampled pulse response. The worst case when I say worst case received symbol I am assuming g of 0 is the cursor this is the intended received symbol and all the others are adding in the opposite direction. The worst case received symbol would be what? G of 0 minus the summation with uh, I mean uh, excluding the cursor the absolute sum of G of k right. Now, in case of a low pass channel a lot of these g's will be positive, but it is not it is not a nice low pass response right. Meaning uh, it will have ringing and it will have reflections and so on. So, some of these things will be negative also. So, those things could uh, have a I mean those things will become worst case if there is a minus 1 there is this ok. So, somehow you will have a particular combination of symbols which will make the worst uh, which will cause the worst inter symbol interference into the symbol at the cursor ok. So, that is one way of uh, measuring the bit error uh, I mean one way of estimating the bit error, but that can be actually quite pessimistic. So, if you average over all the possible combinations you will get a better estimate. This is especially true when you have a large number of elements when you have a large number of elements the distribution of those things will also be quite wide. So, if you take only the worst case you could be severely overestimating the error ok. Is this fine? So, what Ashwini Kumar suggested earlier was slightly different what was that it was to take the variance of this right. The received sim symbols have a distribution received uh, signal has a distribution you take the variance of that what will you get I mean it is uniformly distributed. So, you can find the variance ok. So, you find the variance of this ok and then let us say that is sigma s and then you find define a new noise which is sigma n prime square is the actual noise plus sigma s square ok. And then you take q of let me just say g of 0 is 1. So, let me say that you take q of 1 over sigma n prime will this be ok what do you think you will get here. Because the signal has some distribution is saying that it is like 1 plus noise right <coughs> that 1 plus noise that plus noise part has its own variance and is adding it to the random noise that is coming in. Will we get the same result will it be different or if it is not correct why is it not correct. Yeah something yeah yeah that is right yeah. Ok. So, what uh, so what precisely is wrong with this. So, certainly so let us say I had a signal here ok some egg uh, some let us say y and I add some n 1 this is ok and I add another noise n 2 which is n of 0 sigma 2 ok. 
So, in this case would you agree that uh, would you agree with that algorithm? So, I will do I will add some n 3 which is n of 0 sigma 3 which is also Gaussian distributed and then where sigma 3 square is sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square will this be correct? Huh? This is correct. So, what he is uh, the idea is that he is saying that hey why I mean you have this uh, distribution of symbols and that is like adding noise and I will add the variance. So, what is wrong with this? Uh, it is uncorrelated because the noise is uncorrelated with the received signals anyway. So, the part refractal density of which one? But that is not rela relevant here, right? Like just think of it in the time domain. I have some uh, discrete time symbols coming in, okay. Noise is uncorrelated with the <coughs> yeah. Uh, it is uncorrelated because uh, all the other symbols are uncorrelated with this symbol, ok, right. So, we are assuming that the symbols are uncorrelated, the received symbols is AL and then you have AL minus 1, AL plus 1, etcetera contributing, they are uncorrelated to this. It is not the uncorrelated stuff. The problem with this is that with any finite number of symbols right, you will get a distribution that does not tail off to infinity that has a finite width, it is actually exactly 0 beyond that. Whereas, a Gaussian it has an infinitely long tail. So, if you add two Gaussians that is fine, both of them can cause bitter errors ok. The easiest way to think of this is let us say you do not have random noise at all right. Okay, this is the extreme case, you do not have random noise, you only have ISI. Okay. So, now if you calculate the variance of this distribution uh, the way I have drawn it and calculate the bitter rate, will that be correct? What is the bitter rate here? This is the distribution, there is no random noise, what is the bitter rate? I mean this is 0. Okay. So, what is the probability that any of this will be received as minus 1? It is 0. Okay, so, there is no bitter rate at all. The reason is that while this has some variance and in fact, for a large number of uh, symbols that could even be probably approximated to be Gaussian, but it can be approximated to be a Gaussian only when the values are large, not when it is tailing off to infinity where the values are small. Okay, so, that is the error. So, that is why the bitter rate looks much worse if you do this because the variance of this is quite large. The random noise will never be that large hopefully, I mean it is not as large as ISI. I took a simple case where there are only three of them. If you take a, a large number, this distribution can kind of look like a Gaussian. That is not a problem because if you also these are impulses, right? If you kind of smoothen them out, it will look like a Gaussian, but it will look like a Gaussian, but it will definitely not have the infinitely long tail, okay? Because this is something to remember. You know that lot of uh, distributions have this, a lot of. Uh, naturally occurring things have this Gaussian distribution, especially if you start adding random variables, you will start getting uh, Gaussian distribution. That is if uh, let us say x 1 is uniformly distributed, x 2 is also these two are identical, both have this uniform distribution. x 1 plus x 2, what will be the distribution? This I think you know right, this is the probability density function, I mean I should not say distribution, the density function, the probability density function. What is the probability density function of x 1 plus x 2? Huh? It will be a triangle, it is this convolved with itself. Let us say you have a third one x 3 which also has the same thing. What is uh, x 1 plus x 2 plus x 3, what will that look like? It will be a parabola, so it will start from there and it will do that. And if you take enough of these, it will look like a Gaussian, but any finite number of these will have also a finite extent, it will not go to infinity. Okay. So, while this part of it can be well approximated by a Gaussian, the small error part cannot be approximated as a Gaussian. So, that is the issue. Okay. So, that is why you should uh, distinguish between 
there is long tail noise like the Gaussian noise which appears mainly because of random noise right this thermal noise and other noises versus ISI and so on which you should think of as reducing the signal amplitude okay there are other things also like crosstalk that we will see. So, that also I mean if you if you add a like multiple contributors right the distribution can look like Gaussian, but like again you should uh, look at where it looks like a Gaussian it is when density function is large that it looks like a Gaussian when it is small it looks like uh, I mean something else I mean it may be 0 also whereas a Gaussian the true Gaussian never actually goes to 0 it goes off to minus infinity ok. So, we will see all those things, but at least now you get the hang of when you have ISI how to calculate the error rate ok. Now, it is possible that this sum the sum of absolute numbers can be more than g of 0 that is entirely possible there is nothing uh, fundamentally wrong with that case if you have a lot of ISI that is what will happen. So, then what happens to the bitter rate it just goes to pieces you just cannot distinguish the symbols at all ok. So, then we will have to do something essentially to figure out whether uh, your uh, whether you have to take some extra steps before you can recover the data you have to compute this if this absolute sum the uh, ISI is very large. So, that means that may be your g of 0 is 1 volt and the rest of it is bringing it down to let us say 50 millivolts then I mean you probably have to do something before you start recovering the bits ok. We will uh, continue the discussion from here, but please think about these things. <coughs>